Hi, healthy homies! Welcome to Humanitarian Chronicles, where I feature extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Dr. Pam Popper is a humanitarian in the first degree. She is the queen of studying and reporting legit scientific studies about health and wellness and life. She is a passionate advocate for evidence-based science and truth about medicine, teaching the masses how to make informed decisions about their health care. She is the founder and executive director of Wellness Forum Health, which is an organization and school where they report true science and teach optimal health and lifestyle habits so we can live vibrantly and make the most informed and best decisions about our own health and life. Oh, there's more. I just want you to know who this woman is that we're sitting with. Dr. Pam Popper serves on the Physician Steering Committee and the President's Board for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, D.C. She is she's one of the healthcare professionals involved in the famed Sacramento Food Bank Project, where economically disadvantaged people were shown how to reverse their diseases and eliminate all medications with diet. Dr. Popper served as part of T. Colin Campbell's teaching team at E. Cornell, teaching part of a certification course on plant-based nutrition. She has been featured in many widely distributed films, which everyone needs to see, Process People, Making a Killing, Food Choices, and Where I Met Her on the Red Carpet, Forks Over Knives. She is the author of the incredibly eye-opening and informative book called Food Over Medicine, The Conversation That Can Save Your Life. And believe me, baby, this conversation today with Dr. Pam Popper and what she has to share will save your life. She is a lobbyist, a public policy expert, works towards changing laws that interfere with patients' rights to choose their health provider and method of care. She is a straight-talking professional who is not afraid to criticize national health organizations, government agencies, medical professionals, pharmaceutical companies, agricultural organizations, and manufacturing companies, many of whom as we all know, have agendas and priorities that interfere with distributing truthful information and promoting public health. So what I deeply admire about Dr. Popper, before I actually let her speak, is that she is so committed to the truth that she, even when a scientific study contradicts her own lifestyle practices and values, she will report on it. And that takes courage and bravery and an iron gut. Actually, she has a really clear gut but that's another that's another video yeah so oh my god double blind studies baby but she reads them with both wise eyes wide open she's reporting on double blind but she is awake so thank you dr pam popper i thought i had to read that entire bio because you are so phenomenal i didn't want to leave anything out well thank you so much You're and so i wish welcome. you were here because oh. you have so much energy you make me feel more energetic you know, I wish you were in the office next to me. We would have a good time every day. Oh, that's the next video. <laughs> oh, man. Well, maybe that can happen. Let's talk after <laughs> off camera. Let's let's talk about that. I need to go through your amazing, incredible, informative, life-enhancing university first. And then we'll talk about me going there. For real. You would love Columbus, Ohio. Oh, my it's gosh. Hey, I'm ready. Seattle, <laughs> Seattle's... <laughs> <laughs> Seattle's acclimated me to colder climates. I think I'm I'm ready. I can move east. We'll talk about it for sure. You're so amazing. You're so amazing. I, I've known you for years. I've been following you for years. I've researched when you say, don't take my word for it, you read the studies. You educate yourselves. Be an informed consumer. Be an informed patient. I have listened to those words out of your mouth for so many years since I met you, and I've been doing just that, and my viewers who watch my show might be sick and tired of hearing everything I'm spewing, but I got it from you, so thank you for being that inspiration. And I, okay. I kind of just, I want to take this today and like just ask you boom, boom, boom about a bunch of issues as I'm a health coach, and a bunch of my clients have so many issues, and I just want to ask you about the main ones. All right. Thank you. But before we do that, I just want to know, how did you get into this wellness game? How did this? Ha how did you get into this? Well, you know, like so many things in my life, they happen by accident. I mean, I don't really believe in accidents. I think things happen the way they're supposed to happen. But I wasn't looking for this. <laughs> you know, a lot of people who talk about, you know, having this kind of an awakening were sick or something terrible happened. That wasn't me. In fact, I was living my incredibly unhealthy lifestyle. <laughs> eating my terrible diet 
And I don't know. I don't know that I was happy about it, but I certainly wasn't looking for anything different. And um, I read an article in a magazine that made me interested in diet for the first time in my life because my only interest in eat was eating. I love to eat. I was fat. I love to eat. And I was a fat person. Wow. And so I read this article and I said something to a friend who loaned me one of John McDougall's books. And I was hooked. It's like, why doesn't everybody know this? Why didn't I know it? I mean, I thought it was pretty smart. So what happened that people like me didn't know about this stuff? So that's where it started. I changed my diet. I'm kind of a radical person, as you know. So it was just like, today I'm eating garbage. Tomorrow, no more garbage, right? I love that's it. That's not the way most that's not the way most change really happens, but that's the way I do things. And then from there, as my interest got more and more, it became what I wanted to do with my life was to show other people this kind of information. And then from there it just grew. And so here we are. Thank God. Oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. It was John, Dr. John McDougall. Yeah, well, thank God it wasn't Atkins or we'd be having a whole different kind of discussion today, oh, right? Well, I'd love to discuss that in this time with you today. We'll get there. But wow, thank yeah. God. I'm so grateful you saw the light. And how do you survive being so healthy and so aware and so smart and such a seeker of truth in this standard American world? How well, do you it's do what it? motivates me. It's what motivates me. Wow. Because when I get up in the morning, I realize that if you, and I used to do this, what I used to do was go to doctors and do what I was told. And then I ate what I wanted without any thought about what would happen to me based on my diet. I was sedentary. I didn't value health. I mean, I did. I wasn't trying to kill myself. Uh, well, not knowingly. Anyway, right. <laughs> but, but, but I just, if you asked me what was important to me, I would tell you, you know, family, community, business, I would list the usual things that people say are important to them, but no place on that list would have been taking care of myself, my body, my health. And I realize now that that was really a bad way to live my life. And I'm 60 years old. Wow. And so I'm very lucky because I changed everything 20 some years ago. By the time you're 60, people in my peer group, they're all taking drugs. They're going from doctor to doctor. They have surgeries. Um, they're worried. They have scary health things happen to them. And I don't take any drugs. And, you know, I, I'm very, very lucky that that isn't what happened to me. But inevitably, if that had, if that article in the magazine and just the way that it had, that hadn't happened by now, I'm pretty sure I'd be medicated. I probably would have had a couple body parts taken out. And by now, I would have weighed 300 pounds. I was on my way to it, you know. Dear so. God. Oh, I'm so glad you woke up. Yeah, do Me you, thank God, do you experience a lot of miseducated haters in that other population, other 60-year-olds, trying to discredit you and the truth? No. Okay, good. No, not, not so good. much, and I'll tell you why. You know, in the beginning, I did, and, and my mistake was in arguing with them. And then, as I got a little more mature in this business, I just decided that here's the deal. We're going to talk about science. And then that settled a lot of it down. But then when I got really, really smart, um, because now you can find a scientific study that says anything. I mean, seriously, nice. the, the medical journals are cluttered with garbage, all right? Totally. So then I came up with a criteria. Yeah. And I have a criteria of how we evaluate evidence. We teach all of our members here how to do it. I mean, I can teach this to anybody in an afternoon. And so now when people want to argue with me, I tell them, okay, so here are the ground rules. I love this. I love science. Ready for a scientific debate. I will put you on my YouTube channel with me on camera, and we will have this discussion. But here's the rule, the, wow. the rules, all right? The rules are that we're not going to talk about our opinions. We're only going to talk about science. And then I'm going to give you 18 criteria, okay? And so you bring the science to the table that meets this criteria, and we will have a discussion. And so you never hear from them again. That's right. And so, and the ones that, and the ones that do try to argue with me, even I'll, I'll say, well, you know, see, one of our criteria is conflicts of interest, for example. And so, somebody will say, well, I read the study, blah blah blah. And of course, I'll say, well, the conflicts of interest. Now, here's what we can do. And I also make this offer, and it's sort of tongue in cheek, but I'll say, obviously, lots of conflicts of interest here. So, what I can do, if you want me to report on your study, is I'll say, listen. This person submitted this study and specifically requested that I remove one of our filters, which is conflicts of interest, yeah. in order to say good things about this. And so, would you like for me to say that? Well, they would prefer I stay silent. I said, well, okay, silence is all right. Then we don't have to bring any attention to this. But if we're going to bring attention to it, then we have to remove that filter, and then I'll have to publicly state that. And, you know, then they really go away. You never hear from them again. Totally unbelievable. Actually, totally believable. I just met with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in L.A. a few weeks ago, and... 
World Mercury Project vaccine advocate, non-vaccine advocate. Um, I want to meet him, by the way, sometime. You will. Well, maybe, yes, let's all meet. But he was saying he has tried to get on every single network there is. And he's a Kennedy. He knows these people. And they say, and even one person said that he could go on Charlie Rose. He's been on Bill Maher. Thank, thank you, Bill Maher. But one person said he could go on, which was Charlie Rose. But he said, only if we get the opposite side to come on and debate you. In uh -huh. I think he's been at this game for 20 years. In 20 years, not one scientist or doctor or vaccine advocate has been willing to debate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on right. TV. Not one. So right. They don't want to debate. Right. Uh, and the it's business about this, about science. getting on television is a big issue. I have a good friend and colleague. Love this guy. His name is Dr. Richard Ablin. And he is at the, at, um, uh, he's in Tucson, at a university in Tucson. Nice. He is the researcher who discovered prostate-specific antigen, PSA. Wow. And he said from the very beginning, there's not a marker for cancer. And of course it became PSA test, you know, it, it, and we've had a million men in the United States have their prostates taken out, most of whom didn't have prostate cancer. All right, so finally some people found Dr. Ablin and said, we're gonna make a documentary about you. We're gonna put it on television, big mistake. What happened is they made a beautiful documentary. It never got aired on TV. And one of the reasons is that the drug companies buy so much ad, so much uh, advertising, they spend so much money on advertising on television, they are not about to let something like that be shown. So okay. we showed it at our conference. We showed our audience the, the, the movie. It was fabulous. But there is a, it's very difficult to get these types of, um, well, we call them controversial points of view. But here's what I want to know. When did it become controversial to tell the truth? Tell Thank me you. exactly how that happened. Thank you. Well, it, it, that's what I was going to ask you. So if we're both stumped, we got to go to the next question. Okay. <laughs> no, there's just there's so much totally fake, horribly poor, and just checkbook science out there nowadays. Yes. It's like, well, that's my other question for you. How do you even decipher which studies are total bull and which ones are legitimate? How do well, you do that? the first thing is you have to look at many things like study design. And let me give you an example of a study design that is bound to show good things for bad things, all right? Good results for bad things. This silly study that was done a few years ago, it was on the front page of the New York Times. The Mediterranean diet is so oh incredibly valuable that we, everybody should start eating nuts and eating olive oil. I read the, the original study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. I checked three times to make sure we were looking at the same study because there's no way this study could have brought all those fabulous comments. Well, here was, here's what was going on. First of all, the low-fat low eaters were eating a diet with 37% of calories when fat, the regular Mediterranean diet, 39%. So of course you're not gonna see any difference as a result of eating a low-fat diet because it's sort of like driving cars into buildings with crash dummies. And the first time you do it, it's 90 miles an hour and the crash dummies mm -hmm. show everybody would die. And then you do it at 80 miles an hour, the crash dummies all show that everybody would die. And then you tell the public, you know, slowing down doesn't help, right? It's ridiculous. Totally, it's a ridiculous, ridiculous. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, so then it gets even better, though. If you look at the actual reduction in heart attacks and strokes and all that sort of thing, it was six-tenths of a percent for the nut group and one percent reduction for the olive oil group. Now, I ask people when we're talking about these kinds of things, what are you willing to do for a six-tenths of a percent reduction in something? Okay, so if somebody said, you know, Pam Popper, you're 60 years old, and at your age, probably you could reduce your risk of being in a car accident by six-tenths of a percent if you didn't drive at night. Right. Am I willing to give up my social life for a six-tenths of a percent? I would No do way! Across the You're a right? hip there grandma! Yeah. No! So, so the whole thing is that it's useless. That Some of these studies are just by design useless, and then the results are reported using relative rather than absolute reporting of the data, which makes everything sound like it's so much more interesting than, and better than it really is. Right. So I have to read the original study and look at the design and see if it's even worth consideration, and in this case, it's useless information. Yes. The second thing is you can find studies where you've got such a big cohort that, you, that there's something statistically significant going on. But it doesn't make any difference to people in terms of their life. Like the, the good example is there are drugs that reduce your number of episodes of chest pain from five to four per week. Okay. You still have chest pain. Right. You still have advancing coronary artery disease. 
nothing's really changed for you. So it, it's statistically significant, but clinically meaningless is what we call that. Love it. So these are the types of criteria that we use so that you can start to filter out these studies and, and say, okay, you know, the filter gets rid of the, the noise, the background noise. And then nice. you end up with a handful of things. You don't want to throw the baby out with bathwater because there is really good stuff in the medical journals. But, but to get rid of 90% of it, and then the 10% of it that's really worth talking about, you can spend some time on that. That's right. And if you watch Pam Popper's Anything by Her, you will get the 10%. You will see yeah. the legitimate 10% out of Dr. Popper's mouth. Yeah, right. I, and it's like I read these studies and they'll they do what they did in this country with the ACT scores and the SAT scores. They saw that we were at an F level in education and we're third world country. I don't even like that statement, but that's what they're deeming us in terms of smarts and education these days is we are literally third world. So they just upped the minimum. They didn't mm -hmm. change the educational system. It still right. teach to the test. It's still cookie cutter. It's still bull, but they just upped the minimum. And from mm -hmm. watching you, actually, and reading other scientific reports about actual science, I feel like that's what they're doing nowadays mm -hmm. with these tests and screenings. They're just upping the minimum type yeah. of thing. I'm, could you, like, expound a little bit about that? Well, the, the education system is the beginning of the problem. We, we've got people going to college who don't belong there. They shouldn't have been let out of middle school. Yeah. They've been passed along, and they don't really have any clinics critical thinking skills, and then they end up in some science-related endeavor. And I think people go into healthcare for good reasons. They end up in bad institutions. And good people in a bad environment, sooner or later it starts to rub off. But, but part of the bad education that leads to the bad environment is not learning how to, first of all, the medical schools, nobody's is encouraging independent thinking. That's right. In fact, it's completely discouraged. Yep. Okay. Ugh. And then the second thing is that um, there, people really are not taught to read research and critically look at research. Because, and and the, the influence of medical of uh, medical device makers and drug makers, it starts early in medical education. So you've got that culture going on. And at the end of the day, you end up with a lot of well-meaning people who want to do the right thing, but just have a very bad foundation sucked into a bad system. And yeah. there you have it. Doctors. That's why the consumer right. has to be informed. Because... You can't count on the people you're asking for advice from to be informed. Right. Well, I love what you said on one of your videos. Like, the top doctors in the world, definitely in the United States, take care of the president. The president ate himself and threw his lifestyle into heart disease. And what did he have? A triple, quadruple, quintuple bypass? And then an angioplasty an because angioplasty. the artery closed back up. President yeah. Clinton. So while he was recovering from the angioplasty that his top doctors, through encouraging him to eat steak and fish oil and all this stuff that causes bad health and angioplasties that are necessary, while he was in the hospital, he got a hold of T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study, and another book, and awakened by himself. But these mm -hmm. top doctors and surgeons who were like, oh, don't, don't, you don't need to change your diet. Diet has nothing to do with your heart. President Clinton's like, you know what, after going through that, I think I'm going to change my diet. Because there are other doctors and scientists that are writing something different that's logical, and I think I'm going to go that route. Well, and he's such a great example to use because yeah. of the fact that he was the President of the United States. And if the President of the United States cannot get truthful information about health, what is the hope for a person living in Westerville, Ohio, getting the right answers about health. You better take responsibility for this yourself. In fact, I tell people that, and, and there's a guy by the name, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Dr. Karl Popper. He's not a relation to no. me at all. <laughs> but uh, he was a philosopher and a scientist who lived in England. And he had a very good, I use a couple of his uh, quotes in my slide sets, because what he basically said is when you're looking at anything, he wasn't talking about health or economics or politics. He was talking about any ideas at all that you're looking at. What you want to turn into is a healthy skeptic, okay? Not a cynic, but a skeptic. And so you look at a new idea, and instead of just jumping on it and thinking it's right, what you're being told, you assume it's not until you prove that it is, which is the exact opposite of how everybody does everything. Exactly. We listen, we're so susceptible to messages from healthcare professionals and advertising and talk shows and news media and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people just, I don't do it anymore. I learned my lesson. But people just listen and then they adopt these ideas. Instead, say, that's very interesting. 
I'm going to be looking into it, whether it's about economics or politics or government or medicine or education or anything, look into it. Yeah. And then arrive at your conclusion. And it leads to a totally different place. In fact, Popper, the other Popper, says, what you do is try to prove it wrong. And then if you can't prove it wrong, then you know it's right. You know, So it's a lot more work that way. But I think being a thinking person is a lot of work. And I think the alternative is so dreadful that we probably better start teaching people to work at being thinking people. I, I think, think that so, would be too. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Because the numbers I've read and what I've seen in my own life, every single person I know, almost almost every person I know who got chemo or over biopsied or radiated has died in my personal mm -hmm. life. Every person I personally know, almost everyone. The other ones are not living as vibrantly as they were before. I don't know how much longer they're going to have to live, God forbid. But it's like, I feel like everyone is seeing this with their own parents and children and relatives and friends and community members. How come mm -hmm. we're not just watching one person after another die at the hands of this miseducated, ignorant system, oh, 1.3 million people a year die at the hands of allopathic medicine, not people, people in the United States. That's just America. Right. It's surpassed right. heart disease. It's surpassed cancer. And that, I got that figure two years ago. I'm sure it's gone up, right. but like, and oh, you know, there are caveats, people who have really strong minds, bodies, souls, wills to live. They can overcome chemo. They can overcome eating tires every day. But you know, it's like, how come people aren't looking at this, us, one celebrity after another, dying of chemo? How come they're not looking at this and saying, wait a second, everyone that I send into that hospital on a gurney is coming out dead or half dead or not living five years? Like, I just, I guess I'm a logical person by nature. I just don't understand the disconnect. But you're, you hit the nail on the head. There's something about our educational system and probably the fluoride in the water and the toxins in the food that is just lowering our common sense well it's that and the medical profession has done a wonderful job of marketing i've often said if the pharmaceutical industry unleashed its marketing power on my company <laughs> my <too. laughs> and I, we'd do a billion dollars a year in sales oh, so very smart people and, and that run these medical institutions and professional associations and, and so they're very very smart and good marketers and what's happened over a period of time through a number of different ways, ranging from advertising, which we mentioned before, but also the way that you position yourself. Like the American Medical Association became very, very powerful, managed to get doctors licensed and keep other types of people from the, in the health business out of the health business. So you control who's allowed to talk about it. That way you can control the message. This has been building for a hundred and some years. People who um, have been very, very deliberate and um, very, very good at crafting a message that says medicine in the United States is fabulous, it's the best in the world, you're a lucky person to have access to it, um, and, and they're good salespeople. Let's face it, they're just good salespeople. Well, what and that's how we ended up here. Yep, Dr. Benjamin Rush, everybody look into him. He warned about this during the writing of the Constitution. He was the first Surgeon General of America, talked all about this. He said an underground, basically an underground mafia will form if we don't put some amendments in the Constitution, which is freedom of our own health and medical. But did they do it? No. They did it for freedom of religion. Anyway, look up Dr. Benjamin Rush. But my, you know, speaking of all that, well, my God, I have so many questions about all that. Um, well, actually, what I really want to do is ask you about just everything. I, I just have so many questions. I just, I mean, honestly, like, there's just so much going on in my head that it, we need to do another video on that whole thing. Okay. But I mean, I'm like, as many as you like. I yeah, promise. I'm like, because you are so knowledgeable about all this stuff. I would just love to touch on all of this with you. Well, actually, I'll ask it now because it is a question I wanted to ask. Again, it's another whole video. What do you think about insurance and the healthcare system in this country? Well, there's a lot we could do differently, and I think there's going to be a lot that is done differently in about another 48 hours, and I am Thank very God. much looking forward to it. So right? am I. I know. I know. And that's a controversial thing to say, I, but, I'm with but you. Um, it's time. It's that's definitely right. time for things to change. And the first thing I want to say is we have got to get politicians out of running our lives, including healthcare. 
The second thing is that there are models for some of what the new administration is proposing in other places. And let me give you an example. Um, in Israel, for example, insurance companies do business throughout the whole country. They're not limited to territories like here in the United States. Everybody's got to go state by state by state. And so it's very expensive for insurance companies to do that. And when you make it expensive for companies to do business, guess who gets to pay for that? You and I. Okay. Right. So one of the things that the administration is proposing is that we have insurance companies who can do business all over the country you really lower costs and then make it really really competitive let me give you an example of how this works in israel in israel there's a huge amount of interest in alternative medicine so much so that one in seven israelis is trained in some kind of alternative modality that ranges from foot reflexology to herbal medicine okay so if you are an insurance company doing business in Israel, guess what you have to cover if you want people to sign up with you? You have to cover these modalities. Because if you can't, then people will go sign up with the other insurance company who will. So right. you make it competitive. You make it policies that people want to buy, the coverage that they want. That's the first thing. The second thing is in Singapore, and this is why medical savings accounts becoming coming back into vogue can be so important. In Singapore, people pay into an account for their health care. And then they have a reinsurance policy in case they have a heart attack when they're 31 and they haven't saved enough money yet. Right. But the people spend their own money that they put into their accounts. And so what's happened, two things. The first thing is when it's your own money, you're conscious of how much it costs. Yes. Right? You're telling me it's 2500 for an MRI? I don't think so. Right. I think you should sell it to me for less because the guy down the street will. Right? The second thing is you're really conscious of what you're paying for. This doctor was mean to me. I'm not going back. It's my money. It's the way you wouldn't buy a car from somebody who disrespected you. So you don't buy health care from somebody who disrespects you. So the market in Singapore, because of that, because people are paying with more of their own money, has become very, very, very competitive. And Singapore has become the tourism, medical tourism capital of the world right now. Wow. Um, because if you're doing something that doesn't involve an emergency, like you, you could actually fly there and have it done, it's one of the best places to go because there's huge competition for quality and price. So some of that's going to happen here. And I think that's going to be a very, very positive step. And I think one of the unfortunate things that's happening is a lot of people who won't listen are not looking into anything, are basically saying, everybody's going to lose their insurance, the world's going to come to an end, and that's not what anybody's proposing here. So let's just take a deep breath and see what happens, and you just might like it. I agree. I'm with you, sister. And in honor of the Women's March, which I will not be participating in because I'm hopeful, and yes, I bless our new administration to do the best for our people. Um, in honor of the march, I would like to talk about women's issues, which you are yes. a total expert about, starting with mammograms. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, stop doing them. And here, here's the problem. And a colleague of mine who I'm bringing here to the United States for a conference in the fall, Peter Gerchke, co-founder of Cochrane Collaboration, wrote a great book on this topic. It's a little tough to get through because he's a real scientist, but it's called Mammography, Truth, Lies, and Controversy. And it's about his story. What happened is Cochrane got brought into this when Denmark was unsure as to whether or not mammography should become part of what the government pays for. And by the time Cochrane Collaboration finished its research, the Danes had jumped off the cliff and like we did here in the United States and made it a normal part of medical practice. But mm. by then, Cochrane had figured out, all those researchers had figured out that mammography does not reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer. And the only way that a screening program works it, and how you evaluate it is it has to meet one of two thresholds. It either reduces comorbidity or it reduces death. If it doesn't do those two things, there's no reason to do it. Right. So we spent $8.3 billion on mammography here in the United States, and, and it's forced into, that's part of what's made an insurance premium so expensive because the, it, you have to get it for free. We know there's nothing free. So it's forced into uh, all these health plans, which encourages people to have more women to have more mammograms, and it does not reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer. I'll tell you what it does do. It increases the risk of being diagnosed with what we call an incidentaloma. This is something that you would be better off not knowing about. Yeah. Okay. But humans don't do well when they find out about a small abnormality. That's where let's take it out. And then the overtreatment begins. Surgery followed by radiation about
about a third of the women who are diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in situ, which is not cancer, will not progress to cancer most of the time, okay? About a third of the women are opting for mastectomy. Unbelievable. Sometimes by a lot of mastectomy. Yeah. It is unbelievable. It's I, ridiculous I over treat. We've done it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and, and the problem is it's very difficult. A lot of these women will come here to look at our uh, and all that sort of thing. And it's just very difficult for them to change their mind about this. Once a doctor has uttered the C word, you have cancer. Um, just, I've had women say, I see what you're saying, and I look at the evidence, and I know that you're right, but I, I have to get this thing out of here. And I just, just take off my breath. I don't want to have to worry about this anymore. It's insane. It's insane. Well, actually, taking off your breast causes a lot more problems for your body. You might not uh -huh. have a breast issue, but you'll have a heart attack or all the other side effects of getting your breast lobbed off. Sometimes I just want to say, and I know it's female doctors that are doing it as well, but it's mostly males from what I've researched. I just want to say, hey doctor, you, you seem to have some abnormal testes. How about we lob your testicles off? Just to be safe. Just to be safe. <laughs> There's a little lump, you know, it could just be, you know, you're not the hygiene, whatever. Like, let's just cut your balls off. How about that? Like, yeah. what? And nobody would, would propose that. Yeah. I just, yeah, well, I, just, um, I tell it's, my it's friends to propose we that. We call it disease mongering. This yeah. is what we call disease mongering. It's where you take healthy people and you suck them into a system and you convince healthy people that they're sick. And and the reason, all it's not just mammography. It's mammography, PSA testing, DEXA scans, um, testing for pre-diabetes, asymptomatic people for thyroid disease. And, and here's the analogy I use to explain it to people. Let's say I live in a house that's about 3,000 square feet. And it's about 28 years old. I've lived there for a long time. So let's say I put an announcement out that I want any contractor in the greater Columbus area who wants to, to come to my house tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to open the doors. I'm going to let people wander around looking for things to do. Can you find anything in this 30-year-old house that you think we ought to do? Exactly. We'd be under construction for the rest of the time that I live in the house. That's a whole different story than calling the plumber when the kitchen sink leaks. That's legitimate, okay? I have a problem, you come fix it. What's not legitimate is looking for things, yeah. you know? I think, you know, it looks like your cat scratched the baseboards. We should rip out all the wood and, you know, it, that's the insanity that's going on in yeah. health care. Yep, you look long enough, you're going to find something. You do mm -hmm. enough of these skin screenings and PSAs and uh, mammograms, please, no! I mean, I know, I know women who've gotten breast cancer from mammograms. It literally damages their breast tissue so much to the point where it actually creates cancer because it's so mm -hmm. damaged. I mean, it's it totally insane. So thank there's you. Another thing, there's another thing that happens too, and that's the, the biopsies. There are some interesting studies that have been done where you can see where the cancer came out of the, of the um, small mass that wasn't even cancer, but some abnormal cells came out and tracked through the breast and that actually was how those cells left a very contained area and that's how you ended up with a metastasized wow. uh, cancer so yeah. it's uh, it's just insanity so the, the bottom insanity. line is is you don't want to hang out with doctors just like you don't want to have your house full of repairmen looking for things to do you don't want to hang out with doctors looking for things that are wrong with you and um, when you get to my age it's it's I take really good care of myself and I'm in great health I have a lot of energy and you know, I don't have any aches or pains or there's nothing going on that makes me think that something's wrong but here's the point that I'm getting at I'm sure if I showed up in a doctor's office and I said listen Let's see if we can find something. Okay, you just keep poking and prodding and imaging. So we find some minuscule thyroid nodule. I'm sure there's something going on that we could be concerned about. And then that's how you get sucked into the medical mill. Yeah. So I'm not an idiot. If I had a pain in my side and it didn't go away in the next few days, I'd go have it checked out. I mean, I'm not you know, stupid. But but in the absence of that kind of thing, you, you protect yourself the best when you take optimal care of yourself. And stay away from the healthcare profession. Hippocrates, let your food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You are your own right. doctor. Yeah. Well, what well, do you. Another, yeah. There's another thing, too, that I want to say that I think is important is that this all this hanging around with doctors and testing has convinced people that their bodies are fragile, subject to breaking. You know, they, they become worried. And so, and, and I just wrote an article about this. That um, while people are focused, they get focused on minutia and they miss the bigger point. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. I have people coming in here who are 100 pounds overweight 
and they're taking six medications and nobody's ever talked to them about why are you eating pork chops and french fries and toaster pastries and all this garbage all day long when and and becoming bigger and sicker every year so they, the big thing got missed you don't exercise etc but then they're taught to pay attention to every little symptom I have a pain in my elbow. Do you think it's bone cancer? Yes. And then, you know, I have a headache. Do you think I have brain cancer? And I have a hangnail. Is it normal to get hangnails? They get hyper-focused on minutia because these are all things that you can go get images for and drugs for and all that kind of stuff while they're missing the big picture. So the focus needs to be on real health. And real health is taking care of yourself. And by the way, it's what we do with everything else. If I took care of my body um, like if, if I tell people, you take care of your body like you take care of your house, you're probably going to live a good long time. But if you took care of your house like you're currently taking care of your body, you're probably not going to be able to live in it much longer. Totally. Okay. Foreclosure. Oh, yeah. my God. You, I love your analogies. It's so true, people. Everybody take care of yourself. Look at Dr. Pam Popper. You're a grandma. You're yep. living it up. You're enjoying life. You're vibrant and healthy. You're teaching others. My God, let's all be like that at 60, 70, 80, 90, 150. For God's well, sake. Yeah, my, my dad's 86. Oh. And we had an interesting experience um, about three weeks ago. We had, I don't know if you guys had it in Los Angeles, but we were one of the cities that was chosen to have the Chinese Lantern Festival. Oh, well, we and, have uh, it in Seattle. Here in Seattle. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Okay, yeah. so here's the deal. My dad's 86 years old. He works here three days a week. And so oh. I guess spent time with him, which is great. So I bought him for his birthday to take him to a dinner and dance event that he likes a lot. And then we went to the Chinese um, Lantern Festival. Mm. So this was outdoors at the fairgrounds, right? So I want you to think about this 86-year-old guy. So this thing was so well attended. We had to stand in line with this mass of humanity for like a half hour to get in. And then it's outdoors and it's at the fairgrounds and it's very uneven territory it's where like when they have the state fair they've got cows and horses and all that kind of stuff all over the place and this exhibit was huge so it took two hours in the cold it's 30 degrees that night to walk all over and of course i'm watching people um are you know tripping and all that kind of stuff because the ground is uneven i don't have to worry about that with my dad and we got in the car this is a half hour waiting to get in two hours walking around in the cold he goes well now what i said now what i'm taking you home i have to go back to work he goes, I thought, well, maybe we go out. I said, well, you go out. I got to go back to work. Oh, my god! And gosh. so he's an example of, you know, being 86, and he's not sitting at home in a rocking chair. You know, he's out doing stuff. He's always up for doing stuff. If I called my dad right now and said, hey, I know it's last minute, but you want to go downtown and do X, Y, and Z, you go, great. So amazing. Okay. So amazing. Yeah. Well, I was going to say good genetics, but then that brings me to my next question for you, which is the genetics lie. <laughs> I want to say good genetics, genetics but it's not true. We have we have the same lifestyle habits. My mother died four years ago, oh. and um, and her uh, that was four much younger than she than she should have died. She was seventy eight years old, and um, she should have lived to be ninety or ninety five, but uh, she didn't take care of herself. My sister. Yeah. Not so much taking care of herself. My dad and I, we do. This is the way we are. So, you know, genetics are. It's not that they're not important. It's that. Um, the genes that control your color of your eyes and how tall you get, not much negotiating going on there, but you can negotiate with the rest of your genes and you don't have to get arthritis. You don't have to get cancer. You don't have to become a type two diabetic. You don't have to get fat. You don't have to become infirm. You don't have to sit for the last 20 years. I mean, these are all things that are, um, determined by your behavior. So right. it's not that genes aren't important. It's just that they're not the most important. Right. Thing. I mean, less than 5% say the epigeneticist genie in the genes. Are, are what is going to give you disease. It's what your lifestyle is that's going to switch on that cancer gene. Well, that brings me to my other question about breast health. What about the BRCA gene, which is why so many women are just going like sheep to the slaughter to get their breasts cut off because of this well, BRCA the thing, gene? The, we now have some data looking at women who, had, um, who have that gene mutation who did and didn't have mastectomy. And this is what's very interesting. About 10 years out, from the time of the mastectomy, the women who did and didn't have the mastectomy have the same death rate from cancer. 
And the reason is the women who had the mastectomy didn't die of breast cancer. They would die of other forms of cancer because that gene mutation increases your risk of pancreatic cancer, for example. But there's only so many body parts you can take off or out, right? right. So, and, and then, of course, a, a lot of these women also have their ovaries taken out. That's what Angelina Jolene did. And so the problem there is... Now you end up on hormone replacement therapy, you have a higher risk of a heart attack. So, so there's a whole cascade of bad things that can happen once you get sucked into the medical mill that way. So I don't like genetic testing. Um, there's sometimes when you have to do it, and, and there are exceptions. But as a rule, you're better off not knowing. I agree. It, it turns another way you turn healthy people into worried people instead totally. of sick people. Take care of yourselves. You won't egg it on. What, what do you feel about IVF for women who are supposedly infertile? Well, I wouldn't say never, but I think that the first thing that you do is that you 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 fix your body. I, this is the way I explain it to women. What you know, you you have to make a nice home for a baby. That's right. And uh, this is God's way of telling you you're having trouble supporting one life with your habits right now. We're not going to let you have a second one. And so um, I'm a firm believer, and I've seen, well, first of all, the liter medical literature is quite clear on this, that a lot of infertility is due to diet, particularly the consumption of animal protein has a huge effect. Yeah. So change, the, and it has the same effect on men, men who have abnormal sperms, from fertility problems, that sort of thing. So the first thing you do is you, you, you rebuild your health, you rebuild your body, you take off the weight, you resolve the diabetes, whatever is going on, you take care of those things. And most of the time, most, not all, but most of the time, the pregnancy results. We've had over oh, 114, 115 babies here born of moms who were told they couldn't conceive or could not carry a baby to term. Yeah, all men, sister. I have experienced the same thing with my clients and working with Hippocrates Health Institute. I've seen it with my own eyes. So, yes, uh -huh. you make a fertile breeding ground for your life to form inside of your, your body, and it will. You don't need exactly. chemicals and hormones that mess up your body even more, like birth control pills. Right. What are, exactly. What do you have to well, say about those? Birth control pills are carcinogens, and um, class one carcinogens. And, and this has been well documented in the medical literature. Now, here's the good news. If anybody's watching this and saying, oh, my gosh, I've been taking them. If you stop taking them, Within about five years, your risk factor for breast and ovarian cancer will be the same as if you never took them. But on the other hand, every year that you pile on taking them, your risk factor goes up and up. So um, I don't like birth control pills. And what's really disturbing is, and, and let me make a notable exception. If you live in a third world country where men don't respect women and you're a woman who doesn't want to have your 14th child, that's one thing. Yeah. But... These pills are being used in the United States for acne, PMS, um, heavy menstruating, you know, heavy periods. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous and, and no reason for that to be going on. And, and I have to say, part of the problem is the doctors don't know what to do except to prescribe drugs. It's not like they were taught anything different in school. But And so I'll give them a little bit of, I'll cut a little slack there. But having said that, doctors can read the same medical journals I'm reading if they would choose to do it. Agreed. I hope they do. You are such an inspiration. That is right, people. Yep, there are other ways to go about birth control. There's the moon cycle. There's condoms. I know they're not the greatest thing, but there are other you know, ways. You know, Sorry. There's another thing. Yeah. There's a there's a product called Lady Comp. I learned about it when right. I was um, lecturing in uh, South Africa. And it involves a computer program that has tracked menstrual cycles and fertility cycles for thousands and thousands and thousands of women. And your data gets fed into that. And it's very, very, it's as accurate as, um, as oral contraception. Wow. That's a much better uh, option. And it's come down in price. I think it's made in Germany. At one point in time, it costs close to $1,000. Although birth control pills are very, you know, can be expensive too, depending on your insurance coverage. So that's a valid option. Wow. One other thing I want to say um, you know, if your problem is fertility or irregular menstrual periods or PMS, all these things are, you know, God tapping you on the shoulder saying something is clearly wrong, you should pay attention. Yes. But the reason you want to take care of this before you get pregnant, the reason you want to be in optimal health is because being pregnant, delivering a baby and raising a child is an Olympic event. It is for the fit to, to do. Okay. You need to be fit, energetic. And so what I, I see this, this all the time. I see women who are so exhausted while they're pregnant, they can hardly hold their heads up to breastfeed. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we have, we have a yoga student. This is a prime example of the opposite. She came, she was on her way to hot yoga when her water broke in the driveway. Okay. Oh so God. that's how physically active she was until the end. Wow. And so she, she called and said, I'm, I'm going to the hospital instead of yoga this morning. I'll see you guys later. And then she's back in yoga, like 10 days later, handing the baby off to her husband in the parking lot. So, you know, so she can go to yoga and then I'll see you at home. Right. So yeah. that's the way it's supposed to be. Not that you have to have five family members come so you can lay on the couch and do nothing because you just gave birth to a baby because it's only worse after that as they get older and the whole nine years. So, so get those health issues out of the way so that you can be a fun, engaged parent. And this can be fun for you instead of dreadful because you're in such poor health, you can hardly drag your body around every day. Oh, wisdom. That is how <laughs> I'm going to roll. I'm 40. I have yet to breed. But when I do, that is exactly going to be me. Handing yes. the baby off to go to hot yoga, and then we'll go for a walk around the neighborhood till she stops crying or whatever. That is <laughs> yeah. exactly My neighbor how... across the street started jogging like she had a baby jogger, and um, I mean that you know like baby's like two weeks old and she's out you know jogging around the neighborhood with the baby. It's you know that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, babies babies do change your life in profound ways. But they should not change your life in a negative way. Like, I can't do anything anymore. And I, you know, that's that's not what's supposed to happen at all. Totally. Were you healthy when you had your children or not? Did you oh, no. get to optimum health where you are now before you had children or after? No. I mean, I was 38 when I, when I'm 36, 37, when I started waking up and, and it was interesting because I now I said this before, I know I would have been by now, you know, maybe dead seriously if I hadn't changed my ways, but oh, yeah. I, was, I was fat. I had dark circles under my eyes. Um, I just, I was tired all the time and I used to drink coffee to stay awake. And, um, and, but you know, everybody I knew that was that age, you know, running around after kids and stuff, that's the way they were living. So you don't think it's so abnormal, which is unfortunate, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, so no, I didn't wake up until later, but I woke up fortunately because a lot of the people who come in here, their wake up call is I have cancer. I had a stroke. I have type two diabetes. I have, you know, I have migraines. I can't go to work anymore. You know, I have inflammatory bowel disease. I can't leave my house anymore. That's what wakes a lot of people up. Wow. Well, speaking of which, your healthy lifestyle, can you please talk a little bit? We're in marathon mode now. Can you please talk a little bit about the different diets out there that are oh so popular? Ketogenic, Atkins, paleo, blood type diet. We talked about the Mediterranean BS diet versus Pritikin vegan. Can you please speak a little bit about this? I have so many friends who swear by the ketogenic diets. What well, here, the first thing is that people like to hear good news about their bad habits, and that's what a lot of this is. Yeah. The second thing is that people evaluate diets based on short-term results, okay? And, and the definition of works, okay, that's, that's a very subjective thing. And it's back to when, when we look at research, as I mentioned earlier, we have criteria. And so one of the criteria is that whatever you're doing has to make a meaningful difference in the patient's life. And it has to be in the long term because there are a lot of things that you can do in the short term that work, but in the long term cause problems. So a good example is the paleo diet. You'll lose weight on the paleo diet. You will, you'll lose weight on Atkins. And so people say it works. Now here's my response to that. First of all, let me tell you some other things that work. Okay. Chemotherapy works. Okay. Wow. A lot of skinny people from chemotherapy because they don't feel like eating. I'll tell you something else that is great for weight loss cocaine addiction right good all the cocaine you. addicts out there really skinny people and you know what else is good about cocaine addiction your cholesterol goes real low too okay now <laughs> nobody in their right mind is going to take up you know cocaine addiction and chemotherapy to lose weight but wow. that works it's no different than you're telling me well the paleo diet works so these things work in the short term but then on the long term you end up with more problems now if you take a look at what goes on in medicine every day we solve one problem, we create another. So we take, we give you a drug, and then it has a side effect. Well, that's no problem. We got another drug for that. And then it causes diabetes. We got a drug for that. Well, that's essentially the same mentality about this diet. So I do something that in the short term causes me to lose weight. That's what I wanted. And so now I have a heart, you know, I end up with high cholesterol eventually. Okay, well, I take a drug for that. And then, oh, my gosh, I start to put on weight eventually because the effect goes away. 
well, you know, I can do some other crash diets. And then the next thing that happens is, you know, my blood pressure goes up and, and so on and so on. And so short-term results, long-term misery. And so um, we have a lot of paleo and Adkins, and we call them refugees. They come in here after years of doing that stuff. And you know what else is really interesting? They all miss potatoes and pasta. Everybody thinks it's going to be so great, you know. And, and the other thing that I think is amazing, have you ever looked in the grocery store for the paleo product lines? Okay, so this whole thing is based on we're supposed to eat what our ancestors supposedly ate. Right. I could do a whole lecture on that. Right. But we're supposed to eat what our ancestors ate, which, by the way, was like wild antelope, not Tyson chicken in the grocery store. Oh. But okay. Right. But but that's that's not even as bad as this. They have paleo cake mix. Do you think that Stone Age people were making cake mix at the campfire? Good point. And they have you know, paleo candy bars, and they've got paleo cereal, and Adkins now is showing ads on TV for, you can eat carbohydrates on Adkins now, so you can get pizza and all that kind of stuff, so anyway, all these people are promoting these ridiculous products that go in line with these ridiculous um, theories about diet, most of which have no evidence to support them, no reliable evidence, I mean, I read the paleo diet, it's just storytelling. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about my patient, Anne, who used to weigh 500 pounds and she stopped eating pizza and started eating elk. And now, <laughs> and now she's fine. Well, of course you know, you're going to lose weight. Your body's starving. You're starving. Yeah. You're literally well, yeah. starving to death. You're going to lose the weight. The other thing. The other thing is that, that some of these diets work, first of all, because the body is starving. But the second thing is they get rid of crap. I mean, i got to give them credit. They tell you, you can't live on toaster pastries and, you know, Domino's pizza. All right? So, so I'll give them credit for that. And it, it is a step in the right direction from that standpoint. But, oh, my gosh. I mean, all that animal food. and I mean, you know, they've all is, been, totally, they've all been debunked. Didn't Atkins die of a heart attack or a stroke? Yeah. I mean, heart, he was obese. Atkins was obese, died of heart disease. Uh, you know, whoever, who wrote the blood type diet, that's been completely debunked. Mediterranean. Uh -huh. And the other thing which you touched on before is that a lot of these diets and these stories that are written about, maybe it's one case, one uh -huh. person. The Mediterranean diet was like probably 10 people. Oh, and then uh -huh. they can say these statistics like 80% of the Mediterraneans are healthy. Okay, uh -huh. maybe they eat a little tiny bit of olive oil, which is pure poison, but... They walk every day in the sunshine. They have community, God, and useful purposes for their lives. They're not in, an, like, there's so many other factors that are discussed in the Mediterranean, for example, diet. But what's promoted is what they want to promote, which is the olive oil. It's exactly. crazy, you guys. We have to wake up. So, yeah, you talk, oil. Can you touch on a little bit about why oil is a junk food? My clients don't want to give it up. All right. Well, here's the problem. We live in a country where two-thirds of the people are overweight, and most of those are now obese. Okay? Now, let's think about olive oil or any oil. It has 120 calories per tablespoon and 14 grams of fat. Okay? And then it's not just the oil. People like, you know, a lot of nuts and avocados. You know, a cup of avocado has 21 grams of fat. Now, if I, I'm seriously, I mean, I, I weigh about 125 pounds right now, but I can grow myself to 160, 170 pounds really quickly Me too. because the stuff is so calorie dense. And I don't like for people to count calories, but you have to have some consciousness about the calorie density of food. So, so that's the first thing is it, it's weight for me. It's really hard to stay lean because if you look at just like putting salad dressing on a big salad. You're going to use four or five tablespoons of olive oil to do that. Yeah. So we did a little math thing here, and it's in one of my books, that, that um, if somebody like me decided to add an olive oil-based salad dressing to a salad once a day, you'd put on 38 pounds in a year, in wow. a year, if it didn't change anything else. Now, some people say, well, I'm thin, I'm getting away with it. You are from a weight perspective, but your arteries aren't. Right? That's because right. Because we now know that plaques in the arteries are filled with not just uh, saturated fat, but myelin polyunsaturated fat. So that's why the oils have to go. It's easy to do. Nobody misses. They think they're going to miss the oil. They don't miss the oil. And that means all of them. Olive oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, flax oil, udo's oil, fish oil, just to be clear, motor oil, all of the oils out of the diet. Yes. Well, especially fish oil. Uh, can you oh. talk a little bit about that? I know we're running out of time, but... Oh my well, God, we need another video. But yeah, what is the hype? Even on the... Another one for sure. Well, with fish oil, you get a dose of mercury with it. 
I mean, and, and here's another thing too, and, and this is off to another topic, but I just finished writing the, the book based on the Food Choices movie. There's a chapter in the book about um, animals and in the environment, and I've never written about these things before, but I care deeply about them, and I did write about them in this book. Good. And in terms of the environment, we are destroying this planet. We are overfishing. It doesn't help that there are fish farms. That's just polluting everything. And so we have got to stop doing some of these things, or this planet's not going to be habitable for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So there are a lot of reasons to stop eating fish. The toxicity is a big one. And, I mean, seriously, fish has warning labels, okay? If you re Even the government, which doesn't do much in the way of truth-telling, tells pregnant women, don't eat too much fish, it's dangerous. Well, I don't know. If it's not good for a pregnant woman, I don't want to eat it either, right? Yes. So that's, it, it's just a, a re and, and the other thing that I'll tell you, and I'm writing an article about this right now, so those of you who listen to my YouTube channel, it'll be coming in the next couple of weeks, Yay. is there, the studies clearly show that all this emphasis on omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil and that sort of thing, study after study after meta-analysis after meta-analysis show that these products are useless. Totally. Get it from the food. You know, your omega-3 fatty acid needs are so low, and apple has 10% of your omega People don't think about apples having fat, but plant foods have, have some fat and the healthy kind, and you only need a little bit. Nobody comes in here back to the for crying out loud. Yes, right? amen. And I love how you're you're charitable in in your statements. You say these studies, study after study shows that they do nothing at all. I say study after study shows that they do harm. They yeah. do harm. It's not. But you're 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 amazing. Like seriously, <laughs> Dr. Popper, you're you're so incredible. Yes, study after study: fish oil, dairy, oil, protein, vaccines. Um. Pro, uh, animal products, birth control pills, mammograms, salt. Well, not salt. Well, that's another video. But, oh, cal supplements, calcium, oh, yeah. vitamin D. I mean, all of these studies have shown that not only do they do no good at all, they actually do harm. Mm -hmm. So Exactly right. I, like, exactly. I, I need to have you on for an entire other video, Dr. Popper, because I just have I'll so many it. questions to ask you. You're so knowledgeable. You're so incredible. Thank you for using your life to do this very necessary, in-depth research that the human race needs to know about health and real science. I salute you. I am in awe of you. You have educated me to the depths, and I am your biggest fan. So. Thank, Thank you. you so much for doing that. Do you have anything that you'd like to leave us with today? The, the only thing is, first of all, thank you so much for what you said. And I love what I do. You know, Will Rogers said the finest day in a man's life is when he falls in love with his work. Oh. So he never has to go to work again. I think that's, you know, the way that my life is. So I love this and I don't want to stop, right? But but the other thing is that, you know, the, the people are intimidated by health information. They think it's too hard. They can't understand it. It is not hard at all. And here's, and I teach by analogy, as you've already figured out. Yeah. And I ask people, do you drive a car? Yeah. Do you know much about car mechanics? No. You figured out how to make a smart decision when you bought one. How about construction? You know much about that? No. You ever bought a house? Yeah. You figured out how to do that. So why let yourself be intimidated by this? You can learn the basic principles that we've talked about here. And then you start to be in the driver's seat in terms of dealing with your doctors and medicine and your insurance company and all this kind of stuff. You become the informed consumer and drive the process. It's the way you do everything else in your life. It's the way you should do this if you want to have a long, healthy, happy life. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much, Thanks. Dr. Popper. Please check out Dr. Pam Popper. You can Google her and find the most incredible informative videos you've ever seen about every health ailment known to humans. And where can we find you? What's the exact website? Wellnessformhealth.com. Lots of information. I have a newsletter, video clips. It's all free content. Send me an email at pampopper at msm.com and we'll sign you up. Yay! I'm going to be there. I'm going to get signed up. So far, I've just been an outlaw stealing the free <laughs> info, but I need to be an official member of the Wellness Forum. You're so amazing. Wellnessforumhealth.com. Get blown away by Dr. Pam Popper's research and just, like I said, the no-nonsense way she per th shares it, shall we say. I was going to say, right. shares it. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Popper. You're amazing. Thank you. I'm so Thanks grateful for, for you. See you soon in Ohio.